So I'm Matt Leacock, right? yeah. game designer, I live in California. Okay. Um, how much sort of research did you do when you were working on your pandemic games? Um, you know, I wasn't really looking to do a simulation of uh, disease. I, what I wanted to do was have a really scary enemy. And so, um, and I wanted it to feel right. You know, a lot of it is about the emotions involved. And people just naturally afraid of disease, right? It's something that's in the back of our brains. So I was modeling things that people would react to. Um, and then I had people in the medical professions who played it and, and really enjoyed it. Um, I tried to stray away from putting any disease, actual disease names on the, uh, in the game. Well, when I so it's always... People, uh, I think Will Wheaton said on yeah. the show that people always name the diseases anyway. Oh yeah, like they the do that. They fill in the know. gaps, right? And that's more powerful because it's always relevant. So right. if there is a new, you know, there's swine flu, there's, uh, you know, Ebola, there's, you, know, you name it, these things come and go. And so the game stays relevant because it's not named. And also you don't feel bad about it so much, right? I mean, you're all fighting against the disease together. Right. It's not like you're rooting for it. Um. So there was no really a lot of background. Was there another? Thing no, I, I was thinking about. I was thinking when I went early. Uh, I was thinking about doing um, something more educational, where the city cards might have some facts, or you know, do hand washing or whatever. And that would require a lot of disease. But really, I was coming up with a a model that felt right for the spread of infection. And I knew enough about it, you know, how those things worked in order well, to, to do a loose model. About it? So you had some background. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you, you, uh, you I've I read the, uh, the Hot Zone and, uh, you know, you watch movies, et cetera. So uh, did mostly just... Contagion? Did you see before you developed or after? Oh, long, long time after. That was after. Yeah, I was excited to see it. Yeah, yeah that was a great movie, right? Mm -hmm. that was, um, so that actually brings up another point, which is, um, I don't know if you've read Bruno's blog. No, uh, Faduti? Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a while. It's fantastic. I'm always impressed that he does it bilingual. So he's got I know. A, yeah. Dude's a genius, right? Um, so, but he rails against the idea that games should be educational in any way. Mm. You should only focus on the fact that they're for fun. Mm. And mm. I, w I was curious, you know, you had thought about using this partially as a teaching tool mm -hmm. at one point. Uh -huh. Is that part of your design, or how do you... How do you well, I mean, I thought about that and rejected it, because I really wanted the game to be about, you know, I like to create these emergent systems that, that create an experience everybody can engage in together. And you create a circle, and you define sort of the requirements of it for it in the rules, and people all participate. And, you know, I'm not sure I'd, I can kind of understand his point, uh, but each game can be about something else. So if your game is all about education, of course it can be an educational ex experience. But, um, uh, yeah, I think it comes down to what your objectives are for, for any given title. And, and um, how do you dishonestly come into the game design profession? How did I come into it? Yeah. Oh, I've just been doing it as a kid. Uh, all the way up into college, and uh, really wanted to get a game published all along. What were the games that were sort of influential back then? Uh, when I was young, I played a uh, choir um, and a lot of the 3M and um, Avalon Hill titles with my dad and uncle. So I, I like to ask the question of when did you go pro? In other words, I don't. Do you yeah. still have a day job, or are you? I went pro July this year. Yeah, I mean, it basically meaning, you know, I, I, I gave like 10 months notice to my employer and right. gradually reduced my time um, until July. And then I was it hard, what was that identity and how hard was it to give up? It was hard because I really, really enjoyed my former job. Um, I was at an internet startup called Sococo that I was one of the very early employees, internet right. startup, and it was doing very well. So yeah. part of the reason why I stayed with it so long is that it was a great job. Okay, and so did that make it difficult to have time to do game design? Or? Yeah, that was that was a, a big part of it. I had a lot of opportunities and didn't feel like I could really take advantage of them because um, I didn't have enough time. I had a very um, odd response to I think it was the pandemic because I had played, you know, unexpectedly I'd played Forbidden Island first, mm -hmm. and it was I felt this guy's stealing his own material. <laughs> Yeah. Which doesn't seem right because you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Forbidden Island was up for a Mensa Award, and they played it, and they're like, well, yeah, this feels a lot like Pandemic. And then they pointed out it was the same designer, and everyone was like, oh, that's fine. And then it got the award, and they're like, all right, that's great. Um, well, why do we have the, in other words, I can play a worker placement game, mm -hmm. right? And those mechanics are out there. I don't know what yeah. the first one was, but I know Puerto Rico was influential. 
Uh, Aladdin's Dragons is a very early one. Right. Uh, Richard Brees did some uh, early worker placement games. So why do you think, uh, and so it wasn't just me that had that reaction, why do you think they had that reaction too? Was it well, I mean, there is a, there are some, you know, there's echoes of it. So you, the games are very different in uh, presentation and in audience. Um, you know, I mean, the, the board is completely different. But uh, the central core um, way that the tension escalates is very similar. So it's very important to me that you know um, the games are different enough and serve different niches. So when I did a follow-up to Forbidden Island, I needed a different engine to uh, escalate tension, so I sure. put in a new system there for that. Um, one of the things I like to talk about is uh, uh, games are a lot like movies in, mm -hmm. in terms of, and similar to role-playing, they're a type of almost communal storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you talk about escalating tension, and that's key, and that's where a lot of games can fail. Right. How do you... What are some of your, I mean, you are, obviously, you think about it. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tricks or what are some of the things you look for to make sure that is working? Yeah, I mean, the goal is really, I mean, for these co-op games where you're fighting an inhum inhuman cardboard enemy, <laughs> it's in order to keep people engaged, uh, generally you, you've got a good st story structure where you go up to climax and resolution, right, over the course of the game. But also you need, um, you need the tension to ebb and flow, so you get... Um, uh, Robin Laws talks about this in his book, Hamlet's Hit Points, uh, where he looks at story beats, where you've got upbeats and downbeats. And if you're just continually getting better, it, it, it feels a little flat. And if you're just dragging the player down, it's no good. So I look for uh, uh, hope and fear, you know, cycles of hope and fear <laughs> over time. And uh, yeah, it's really just kind of a, a search each time. Um, I stumbled into it with Pandemic, and then with uh, Forbidden Desert, and with some of my newer titles, it's really me actively trying to figure out how to modulate emotion. Right. Um, so you really like filmmakers or storytellers, your emotion and uh, manipulate? Yeah, uh, you could call game design behavior manipulation. Um, that's actually what, as a gra trained graphic designer, that's what they, you know, I, in school, they're very blunt about it, you know, you're, you beha you're modifying behavior, you know. As soon as you understand that, then the better you can do. Uh, but games, since you were fascinated with them from childhood, yeah. those, that was your chosen medium? Or you said graphic design was also... Well, I wanted to be a game designer, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, Mom, I want to be a writer. You know, it's <laughs> I didn't really think I could do it um, because I know how hard it is in the field. So it was always a hobby. It's just something I always did in my spare time. Uh, but with the publication of Pandemic, a lot of doors opened up. And then since then, I've been doing about a game a year, and now I anticipate being able to do more than that. Um, and it, I just reached a point where I could do it professionally. So really happy last July. Yeah, fantastic. Um, how do you feel about creating sequels to your games? Oh well, I mean it's it's um, it's fun. Yeah. And there's a built-in audience, so there's a lot of great things for it, right? You can. What are what are the downsides? Uh, well, I mean I. I uh, you know, just to, to keep engaged, I like to do a variety of things. You know, if I was only doing sequels to a game, it, you know, I don't want to be known for a single game, right? I'd like to have a pretty diverse portfolio. What's that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, that's a very good business but for them. Yeah, and it's a brilliant... I mean, but if you look at Toyber, for example, he's got, like, I don't know, three, at least three different Game of the Year awards. Um, and he's got a pretty diverse catalog, so, you know, you can't point at him and say, yeah, and it's a fantastic it's a game, right? Game, yeah. And variants of it are welcome, in a way. Yeah. Right. But I just, I just look at their booth and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> well, each expansion is a nice marketing opportunity for them, right? Yeah. Um, so you said you played a lot of Acquire as a kid. Did you role play at all? Yeah, I played some D&D when I was in college. Um, I'm trying to think the themes in your games. You know, the pandemic is sort of... Uh, it's not really science fiction at all, is it? I'm just really well, you know, I get a lot... I sign a lot of cards for people that are scientists. So they'll bring the scientist card or the research card and I sign it. And they, they're really into it because it's a game about science. And, you know, I've got a, a triumphant female scientist on the cover. And, it's not, uh, you know, an Italian prince or, uh, you know, um, so I do like the fact that it is, uh, right. you know, more um, about that. What themes attract you as a player? I just like a good, you know, varied diet. <laughs> you know, um, I think we all look for something. I like Camelot. I'm just going to put that out there. I have no objections to it, you know. I mean, I like, uh, um, I, I look at the game more, more than anything, and if the theme helps, understand, you know, Helps you understand what's going on in the game. That's great, and it, it immerses you more. That's that's wonderful. Um, 
And again, you know, if, even if it's stapled on, if I'm enjoying the underlying game, I really don't have a problem with it. Right. I, had a, I had a very interesting talk with um, Reiner, and mm -hmm. I was like, you know, that's his reputation. Yeah. That your, your themes are just pasted on. And I said, you know, like Tigers and Euphrates, because it's, it's very abstract or whatever. Yeah. But you know what he said to me? He said, I spent months researching that. I'm sure he did. Region. Yeah. And just because it's abstract, the mm -hmm. fact that you have that physical region affects the entire gameplay, mm -hmm. and it doesn't exist, which I, which I Well, you have farmers and leaders and traders and things like that, and so you, you build the story in your brain, right? He's not telling you to read, oh, you know, the farmer showed up and did this, right? right. You build it yourself. But it's not as, um, you know, it's not like you're looking for mystical parts of a flying machine in a desert, you know what right, I'm saying? Right, right, yeah. That, that feels more thematic. But that doesn't mean it's more thematic in a way. You see what I'm saying? I'm yeah, sure I, see, I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, and I think he's very successful at what he does. I mean, uh, Tiger's in your face is one of my favorite games, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a genius game, and my brain starts to <laughs> seize up when I... Um, and that has that ebb and flow, of course, mm -hmm. that you talked about. Uh, what else? Ask me something. I don't know. <laughs> We gotta get Eric in here, right? Isn't that that's part of our yeah? Plan. He's gonna show up. Uh, to up. Let's talk a little bit more specifically <coughs> about pandemic the cure. Since sure. We I have that out, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Z Man is kind enough to give me a copy. Wow, because they're out. What? They're out, so it's nice that you got I'm one. I'm gonna go yeah. sell this. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I don't care what you give me, any pandemic game is fine, so I have something to, you know, uh -huh. talk about. Great. Um, um, so, do you want me to explain it? Yeah, uh, right. not or not explain it, but I'll give you a... the development of it sure. a little bit, like, like some of the things you were thinking about, and, and, and yeah. How yeah, so I uh, really wanted to uh, make a highly accessible game of pandemic you could drop on the table and play in about a minute. You know, set it, set it all up, right. uh, get going, have all the emotion of the board game. Um, but be able to finish in about half an hour. All right, so that should take you, what, you know, a couple of days to develop? <laughs> it was about almost three years, yeah. Three years. Well, I mean, I had the, the engine was for maybe, I don't know, probably took about six months, and then everything was fairly when, well when polished. Said, let's, let's break that down yeah, a little yeah. bit, right? So, so six months, are, are you like, have your computer or No, no, I mean, it's the thing is, if you sit there and you're just staring at the thing. Right, so yeah, no, yeah. the creative process doesn't work quite that way. Right. right so I had the luxury of having that amount of time, is what it boiled down to, and I'll take advantage of that time. So um, I, have, I had sets in playtesters' hands, and I would get feedback. Right. And so, you know, one month there may not be a whole lot of adjustments, but the next month there may be more. What is your, are you working on the computer, you're working on the notebook, how are you? Uh, both, yeah. So I, I start out uh, just with a spiral, very large spiral bound kind of sketchbook. Right. Um, do a lot of uh, sketching there. And then um, the early prototypes are usually just uh, stickers and uh, scraps of paper. No, you're a graphic designer by mm -hmm. trade. I, I hung out with Richard Lanius for a while. I don't know if you know him. No, I don't. Yeah, you know Arkham Horror, though, and all Yeah, that. sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's also a graphic designer. That was mm -hmm. his background. I saw his prototypes. Mm -hmm. like he's, he's there pasting and printing yeah. and laminating, and they're just, they're sure. just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is that also something that you do? Yeah, I mean, they develop over time. So I try to avoid jumping into a finished product uh, because uh, it's harder to iterate and you get attached to your you know beautiful pieces um, I learned that early on uh, when I was designing so now they they, they start out extremely crude so that I can rip them up without any kind of second thought but when I'm done it looks a lot like this um, so these you know this ring here was modeled in foam and I, I helped Z-Man out with the industrial design um, you know, just to make sure. What does that mean? Well, I mean, you need to uh, figure out how large these things should be, you know, um, how big the ring should be, how it should function, um, that sort of thing. And what about the graphics on, like, say on that, that piece there? Yeah. You don't actually do the graphics in the end, though. No, but I, I was able to, I work with the uh, graphic designer at Z-Man, and, you know, through my crude prototype, I can communicate exactly what, you know, my intent is, the design intent, and sure. he can run with it and really bring a lot of value to it. So I think for these, I snapped, um, uh, for the tiles, I just snapped pieces of the, the board. So you get the feel of the board game um, right. in, that, in that scale. Now, this is a dice game. Yeah. Um, there's some prejudice in the hobby gamer community against dice. Is that 
true. You know, I think that's really broken down over the last five years or so. I, I really don't get that comment anymore. It used to be all the time, like, uh, the Germans would not play dice games, you know, no chance. Uh, I think, you know, designers have shown that you can do dice games with lots of meaningful decisions um, and still have enough chaos that you can blame the dice. Um, you know, all the, the benefits of the dice game with um, uh, you know, taking away a lot of the sales objections and, you know, they're just fun. So I don't hear that anymore. Oh, that's, um, good. that's good. Yeah. People are becoming more sophisticated to understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's enough right, of just enough great... Just different decision points. Right, right. It's not just roll and move, you know, which is what people, I think, associated dice with initially. You right. know, I don't want to do a uh, you know, game of life or whatever. Game of life or, yeah, yeah. or, or Candyland where, where sure. you're not, there's actually... Yeah, it's yeah I was actually, I, mean, I don't think I was surprised uh, about this, but I don't think I actually heard that comment once during the, the entire show about, oh, it's a dice game. You right. know, it's like, because people understand that um, sure. you can have meaningful decisions now. Um, there's something I wanted to ask you about, oh, yeah. Uh, when you were coming up, as you were, Right, and you studied graphic design. So that was sort of, for you, the closest thing that you could get to game design? No, uh, I did graphic design, and then, um, then I did visual interface design. Uh, so, you know, inter the visuals for interface design for computers. And then I went into interaction design, right. which is designing, you know, all the ways the software behaves. Uh, and then, really, ultimately, experience design, where I designed an entire uh, service, the sounds, the branding, everything. Yeah, right. to nuts. And that's very similar to game design. Um, if there were a game design, now there are game design programs, right? Academic programs. Okay, I'll yeah. take your word oh, for you it. No, no. Oh, okay, no, it's a lot like the film school thing, you know, okay. before. Oh, you mean in schools? In schools I, I was yeah. thinking applications. No, yes, no, no, yes, no. yeah, I'm aware of that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is that, do you think your parents would have let you do that while you were, uh... Yeah, I think so. I, th I would think so. Uh, my folks are pretty supportive. Of, okay. Of and they understand what you're doing? Oh, yeah. They don't yeah, sure. you, like... No, they play test and... Yeah. Oh, they do? Yeah, sure. Oh, that's awesome. And do you have children too? Yeah, I've got a 9 and 11 year old. So how does that work now? With well, they get to play test too. And they, they, I mean, they help with the stickers on all the custom dice. And, uh, yeah. That's fantastic. And they're wonderful for giving feedback because they're incredibly blunt. Yeah. yeah. If well, they're bored, they you, tell you they're bored. Can you, rem okay. can you remember <laughs> any specific things when you're developing, say, this, this game? And uh, um, some of the feedback? Things? Yeah, uh, with these games, uh, or this one, my eldest daughter often asks me questions about, you know, why am I doing this versus that? Because she'll, um, she's very in tune with balance and just wants to know, understand the reason why behind everything. Right. And so it just helped me question, you know, okay, well, what was my intent? And, and uh, helped me look at, when I looked at these roles uh, and balancing them to make sure that uh, they made sense. So. so what was it about Again, let's go back to the three years of, of development mm -hmm. and iterations. What were some of your failures? What, what, what things were really just you thought should work mm -hmm. and you just wouldn't give up on? This was interesting in that it just was a just gradual, continual iteration. It, it wasn't like a big aha, you know, a big change, right. but very subtle tweaks in the distribution of dice. Um, this uh, a ring evolved, uh, the, the dice split for each of the rolls. There's a number of different developments, but it's very, very gradual. It's just like polishing something. Or right. or other games, you know, you just do a 180 or you do a big right turn and, and change them pretty dramatically. Have you ever had a game come out almost fully formed? Um, no. Although I've done games with, you know, in about a month where it feels right. you know, like that's really, really rapid. Okay. Uh, I mean, when you look at Pandemic, uh, the core mechanism of taking the discard pile, shuffling it, and putting it on top of the top, that was almost fully formed, and that's what hooked me. Do you know where that came from? Uh, I was just fooling around. Uh, like, fi I mean, you, you just got some pieces, and you're Were like... You physically fooling around? Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, you have to play with this stuff. Um, you have to physically manipulate and do unexpected things. Because if, you, if it, you just keep it in your brain, um, yeah. it's not going to come out. And even if you do a sketch, it's not quite enough. I think if you want to do something novel or interesting, often you have to just kind of goof off a little bit. Take the pieces, the dice, the cards, yeah. whatever it is. Um, do you ever go back to your game collection and realize you've uh, pilfered your really nice game of Tigris and Euphrates because you needed the bits for a prototype? <laughs> it's usually all or nothing. So there are some games where I'm like, okay, hasn't, hasn't seen any play, it's time to gut it. And then you know, I'll pull the pieces out and cut up stuff. Um, do you have those midnight aha moments where you have to get out of bed and... Uh, it's usually around 4 or 5 a.m., yeah. 
And how does your wife react to that one? <laughs> I usually sneak out of bed, right? So they've got to get back to bed. Yeah. Yeah, what, and yeah, some people it's the shower. Sometimes it's like early in the morning. For you, it's that early. Yeah, it's very early in the morning. Yeah, maybe the second REM cycle. I don't know. Or right after. Very nice. Okay. Um, we should see if we can track down. Sure.